thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to talk about some charismatic plants that are quite nice. And uh, first of all, I'm going to start out by thanking uh, Gary Kropnik and Tom Miranda. Most of what I'm going to be presenting was uh, a talk that we gave at the IUCN meeting uh, last year. And it's about a, an effort to conserve orchids that is focused primarily in North America but has a real uh, global perspective. So let me start with sort of two slides that are the other side, why things are not good. So uh, there may be 30,000 species of, of uh, orchids in the world something in that neighborhood. And the, the larger pie you see here is the result of an assessment of less than 1,000 of those species, something about 13%. Uh, and you can see just on the color coding there that those that have been assessed, they're not, it's not going very well. As an ecologist, if I'm to ask, well, how much ecological knowledge do we have about those species that have been assessed or all of the species in the world to make sound ecological decisions about conservation, my best guess is probably less than 1%. So we don't know much about a lot of the species that are out there. If we put a, a North American perspective on it, here are pictures of, of native orchids in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, there are about 220 species in the, in the two countries, small number, but about 10% of all the orchid genera in the world. And somewhere, almost 60% of them are in trouble somewhere in their range of distribution. So whether you look globally or whether you look uh, at the scale of, the, of this continent, uh, it's, it's not a very good story. And uh, when I became interested in this, I realized that there was no organization in the world that was focusing on the conservation of orchids either at a national level or certainly an international level. Most of the orchid conservation work was going out, collecting things, putting names on them, and trying to keep them alive perhaps in a, in a greenhouse. That isn't going to cut it. So, so we had the opportunity to do something about this. And about four years ago, we established the North American Orchid Conservation Center, and our mission is really simple. It's to conserve the genetic diversity of all the native orchids, initially in the U.S. and Canada, but showing that that model works, we're going to think globally about all the 30,000 species that are out there. So how does this work? What kind of a model do we have? Uh, it's basically an ecological model, and it involves four pillars. The first thing is we have to learn how to propagate uh, native orchids. Very few of them are propagated, and for reasons I'll come back to in a minute. Uh, part of the story is we have to uh, identify, isolate, and have the fungi that the orchids need in order to complete their life cycle. So we need fungal banks. We also need seed banks. The, the idea is to collect the genetic diversity that is local. We want local genes basically dealing with the conservation of the species at a local level. And then, you know, we live in a world with uh, a lot of botanical illiteracy. And I think we can use orchids because they're charismatic to, to educate the public in some of the stories we heard in this morning sessions about getting kids involved and the public involved. But none of this will work unless we, we go outside our ivory towers and involve the public. So all of these things involve people basically holding this model up. And the first thing is it involves collaboration. We can't do this ourselves. There are very few people doing this kind of research. And so uh, initially when we set up the, the, the NAOC, uh, we, we had partners all around the U.S., and you'll notice there are botanical gardens in here and other organizations. So globally, within the continent, we're looking to, to outreach. Since we launched this, we have, and this is just partial, we have now 50, over 50 different collaborators around the U.S. that are, are on board with us at one level or another with this activity. Talk a little bit about the fungi. And the idea here, again, is to, to conserve the genetic diversity of uh, fungi that interact with orchids. And this is not a simple story at all. Most of you, if you know anything about plants, you know that almost all the plant species on Earth interact with fungi. Those interactions are mutualistic. The plant gets something, the orchid gets something. Orchid-fungal interactions are just the opposite of that. The orchids are by far the smartest plant species on Earth. They have figured out how to co-opt fungi. And what orchids do is they eat fungi. And that's an important thing because orchids have two stages in their life cycle, one a critical one between a seed and a seedling where there's, they cannot photosynthesize. So the only way they can grow from a, an embryo to a seedling is to get their food from somewhere, and they get it by eating fungi. A lot of orchids also have a dormant stage, which can last up to decades, where a plant is below ground. It never produces a leaf. And how does something live in the dirt without ever producing a leaf if you're a plant? Well, you have to get your food from somewhere else and you get it from fungi. So for orchid conservation, we have to put fungi, and this shows you all the life history stages where fungi are critical. 
And we know very little about these fungi, but we now can do things that we have molecular tools that are very exciting. We can get the fungi out of the orchid root. They form these little things called pelotons, which are like little balls of cotton in the cells of the, of the, uh, the root. We can grow them in the lab. We can do things with them. We can extract their DNA. We can find out what they are. We have the largest collection in the world at the Smithsonian now, over 600 isolates. 99.99999% of them are completely unknown to science. And eventually, once this works, we're going to have tens of thousands of these things, and we need to be able to put them into long-term storage. And this year, we're starting an effort to look into uh, cryopreservation, working with our colleagues at, at the SCBI. Seed banks, the same thing. We want local seeds, local genetic diversity. Uh, we are establishing regional seed banks. And uh, some seeds are stored in individual labs, obviously, for research purposes. But there also will be a national backup at a USDA facility in Colorado. Here's the key. We have to learn how to propagate orchids. We know how to grow a handful of native orchids. And, uh, and they're really just from a few species, and we just can't do it unless we learn how to put the fungi together with the seeds to create sustainable populations. And this is really ecosystem ecology. You have to create a habitat that has the right conditions for the fungus to be happy, for the orchid to be happy, so that they can produce babies and go on and on. Nobody is doing that for any orchid species yet. Uh, give you some views of this, so what they look like. These slides on the left are you see seeds and these protocorms, the stage that only can get to a seedling if it eats a fungus. And uh, on the right, you see sort of the growing of these little baby orchids, which is not easy, but you know you can do it with and without uh, fungi. And then the critical link here is education. We need to, to have the public involved with us. We need to engage botanical gardens in this process, and we need to get citizen science involved in it also. And we're starting to do that. We have this website. I encourage you to go to it. It's called Go Orchids. It's an interactive website. It has all of the native orchids in the US and Canada on it. You can go in by indicating where you are. You can go in as a, as a botanist and key things out. Or you can say, I, I know the name of this orchid. Up will come a, a species page. It'll tell you everything that we know about that orchid. We also are, are develop, uh, have developed with a collaborator in the, in the Netherlands, a designer, Orchid Gamis. <laughs> And uh, these are being really actively now used in exhibits and educational activities. Uh, I can give you a link to these off of the, off the internet. You can uh, print them, cut them out, and play with them. We have six of them, or, them that are printed now. And as punch outs, I, can, I have some of those with me. And uh, this is what they look like, the front and the back on the top. And then this is an example of Ken Cameron out at the University of Wisconsin making these big blow-ups of these uh, orkagami models and using them in educational activities. So how do we implement the model? Well, we have a regional approach. We want to have regions around the country where they're co collecting the fungi, the seeds, getting involved in propagation and education. This is our current map. We have uh, over 50% of the, uh, the states now involved in the process and ever growing. And we're uh, also moving outside the country. But one of the keys in this is, will be to have botanical gardens involved because they, they're interested in growing things. And we want them to become interested in sustainably growing uh, native orchids. So where the effort stands, I mentioned that we have 50% uh, of, the, of the states uh, are now involved in this. Uh, we, we finally have secured some funding for a development coordinator who makes my life much better. And uh, we have a first small endowment that we've uh, received. And we have these two websites, the one I showed you uh, a bit here a minute ago. And, and the model that we have is now being attracted outside of the US. We have a contract with the Forest Service to start an effort out in the uh, Pacific on all the islands that the, that the Forest Service works on. We're going to start in Palau this uh, June. And uh, there's a group of nine countries in Western Europe that are taking our model. And they have a proposal into the EU to start in Western Europe. And we already have one funded in Greece and Turkey. And just uh, last week, I learned that uh, a colleague in Australia is going to be presenting to that group uh, a similar kind of model for, for Australia. So the idea, I think, is, is a good solid one that people are going on. And we're optimistic. You know, you've got to be optimistic about these things. So we think it's good to have a, a model that's based on ecological concepts and, and, and citizen science. And, and, and the activity that we've been seeing, it's really expanding rapidly. Uh, we're sure that we're going to be able to reach our initial goals, which is to collect material from all the US and Canadian species over the next five years. And as I mentioned, it's already reaching out uh, globally. And, uh, and like all the things that we've heard about this afternoon, long-term success depends on securing the funding 
to make this happen, and we're, we're very hopeful that that will happen also. And I'll end with some acknowledgments. Uh, Jay O'Neill has been working with me at the Smithsonian for 39 years, uh, and he's, he's kind of passionate about these things uh, in learning how to grow the, the fungi and the orchigamis. Melissa McCormick does all the molecular work that we've been doing. And then our Smithsonian colleagues who helped us get this off the ground, uh, the people at Smithsonian Gardens. And initially, this is a collaboration between the U.S. Botanical Garden and the Smithsonian, and we really appreciate all the efforts that they have. And what sort of got me turned on from being just a dumb old plant ecologist to a fungal orchid kind of ecologist was Hanna Rasmussen, who came, came over from Denmark. She had done some of the early work in Europe on, on fungi. And then, of course, uh, some of the funding sources, both internal at the Smithsonian and some of the grant programs that supported us so far. So with that, thank you very much.